topic. Okay, excellent. Um, should be able to see my slides now. Um, yep, we see. It. So let's get started. Um, so I'm here to talk about the supernova early warning system, SNUS for short, um, and some Python software we're developing for studying supernova neutrinos. Um, you can see here the only supernova that's been close enough uh, that we actually detected supernova neutrinos, um, the famous supernova 1987A. Now, I realize most of you are not from, from astrophysics. Um, so as a brief intro, um, supernovae are explosions of massive stars. Um, and they leave behind a neutron star or a black hole. And um, as part of the explosion, a lot of chemical elements, um, things like the oxygen in your lungs or the calcium in your bones, or you know the arsenic in your favorite Agatha Christie novel. All of these chemical elements that are essential for life um, are thrown out into the universe. So we are all made out of remnants from these supernovae. And these are absolutely magnificent explosions where this one single star, like in the picture on the right here, can shine as bright as a whole galaxy consisting of billions of stars. And yet the largest part of the energy is not emitted as visible light, but in neutrinos. And detecting these neutrinos gives us unique insights into the astrophysics, into particle and nuclear physics, um, and all of this under extreme conditions. Um, we can test general relativity, we can, um, so we, we have access to a wide range of, of different physics. Now the problem is that because neutrinos only interact weakly, we need a nearby supernova, basically anywhere within our Milky Way um, to detect these neutrinos. And those happen quite rarely, only about one to three times per century. So the next galactic supernova will be a once in a lifetime event, or at, at the very least, a once in a career event. So our goal is to extract as much multi-messenger information as possible, you know, from neutrinos, um, from gravitational waves, but also across the whole electromagnetic spectrum. And now because neutrinos are emitted right in the moment of explosion, um, whereas the electromagnetic signals only produced, you know, once the shock wave breaks through the outer layers of the star, the neutrinos are actually emitted minutes to hours before the light, which means we can build a supernova early warning system with neutrino detectors. So when, once those detectors um, see something that's probably a supernova, we can alert astronomers and tell them to get their telescopes ready because the shock breakout burst that they are looking for is on its way. Now, this idea is quite old now. It was started um, when I was um, just in kindergarten. Um, and the original Snooze 1.0 has been running in automated mode for almost 20 years now. Today, there are seven participating detectors all over the world, including um, Ice Cube here on the South Pole. Um, but about 2019, um, we start asking ourselves, what would snooze look like if we were to build it from scratch today? You know, with all the progress on multi-messenger astronomy that, that we've had in the past decades. Um, and so the result of it, that is a white paper um, that's published here. Um, and this, so this new design, snooze 2.0, includes a bunch of new features. Um, in addition to just sending an alert with basically detectors saying, hey, I've seen something. And then if, if multiple detectors see something within a 10 second window, we send out an alert to the world. Um, we can do many more things. We can reduce the alert threshold. We can uh, try to get pointing information to figure out where approximately on the sky the supernova is. And we can work closely together with astronomers to develop a follow-up strategy and much more. So with all of this, um, we needed to build a whole snooze uh, software stack from scratch. Um, and I wanna go through that here on, on this slide. So we've got you know, various participating neutrino detectors on, on the top left here. And when they see, um, 
couple of events um, in, in a short time window, which might be a supernova. And they will send a message to the SNOOSE 2.0 server. Um, so this would be an alert, but they can also send heartbeats, basically just to confirm that they are online, they're operating as expected. Um, and in principle, we could also send commands to, for example, measure connection latency or stuff like that. Now on, on this central SNU server, we've got various analysis tools constantly running, um, which look for coincidences between these experiments. And if there is a coincidence, they try to triangulate um, from the arrival time of the signal at, at different experiments, you know, where in the sky is, is that supernova? And they could look you know, for more advanced things like, is this a supernova that formed a black hole, um, which might be visible from the neutrino signal? And now when, when it you know, detects something, um, a likely supernova, it will take all this information it gained from these analysis tools and publish an alert both to both back to the participating experiments um, in case for example one of the experiments had low statistics and wasn't quite sure if this was a real supernova um, but also out to astronomers to um, gravitational wave detectors and to the general public and there's there's actually a mailing list which you can subscribe to right now um, to get an alert from Snooze. Um, don't worry, it's a very low traffic mailing list. I think we haven't had a single alert in the past 17 years. Um, but so, so that's some kind of online messaging system. And then in addition to that, we developed some offline uh, simulation tools um, to deal with, with supernova neutrinos. And these are used um, to develop many parts of, of the online system, like developing some of these analysis algorithms um, running on the server, or setting alert thresholds for experiments, um, stuff like that. And now across this whole um, tool chain, we're using Python basically at all stages. Right? We, we're using it for the you know, pub sub clients here to, to publish messages. Um, or to subscribe to them. Um, we're using it for the real-time analysis tools running on our server. We're using it for the offline simulation tools, and I will demo these in, on Binder um, in the later half of the talk. Um, and then, of course, many of the participating experiments and many of the subscribers, like astronomers, um, probably use Python in many of their internal tools as well. But that's, of course, beyond the scope of today's talk. Now I want to go through, um, through all these different steps of the tool chain here, um, starting with the um, publish subscribe mechanism in RAM. Um, and for that, we have um, developed a collaboration with SIMA, which stands for Scalable Cyber Infrastructure for multi-messenger astrophysics. And this is a project funded by the National Science Foundation in the US. Um, and they're working with IceCube, um, the, the neutrino detector, the South Pole. They work with LIGO, the gravitational wave detectors, um, and, and others. And the, the first product they've developed is called Hopscotch. And this is a platform for handling real-time data streams for multi-messenger applications. Um, and Snooze and Simmer started a close collaboration in the summer of 2020. Um, for Snooze, we were interested in, in this hopscotch system uh, because using it meant that we wouldn't need to implement and maintain you know, all, all the underlying infrastructure, things like identity management, authentication, um, the, the publish subscribe uh, mechanisms and, and so on, right? That's not what we're good at we'd like to focus on the supernova specific parts of, of the stack. Um, but then for SIMA, on the other hand, um, the reason they were interested is because they had just developed this early prototype of hopscotch. Um, so for them, working with us was a real, you know, really good opportunity to get some real world testing, um, to use this in a real application, get immediate user feedback, 
um, if their system works for us or if there's, for example, missing features we need. And this collaboration um, actually went, went on for several months and, and worked so well that after it was all, all done, we wrote this uh, paper um, on our experiences um, of this kind of collaborative software development between two different projects. Um, and that's been published um, earlier this year. Now, in the time since, we've developed these snooze publishing tools on top of Hopscotch. Uh, and these let you either publish, as in the screenshots here, um, or subscribe both from Jupyter Notebooks um, or from, from the CLI. Um, and you can see here the, the message schema for some of these tiers. Um, for example, for the simplest, for the coincidence tier, we send an ID, we send a detector name, of course. Uh, we send the machine time um, for the um, offline, sorry, for, for the, um, the time at which the detector identified this supernova trigger. And we send the neutrino time, which is you know, the starting time uh, of the neutrino signal. Um, then we also have this meta field, um, which in this case is an empty dictionary, but could include additional keyword arguments. And we have a schema version to uh, maintain compatibility if, uh, for example, the server and the participating experiment don't update their software at the same time. Um, and and this, these screenshots here show the subscribe um, functionality. You can see that's also quite, quite short. Um, and you can even give it a custom script um, that will be executed whenever you get you get an alert, right? So this could do something like, um, you know, interact with your Alexa, for example, uh, and have it speak up um, whenever you get an alert. Next up, we have the real-time analysis tools running on the server, and those are all publicly available on on GitHub, like this. Things like the coincidence system, which just looks for coincidences in a 10 second time window. Um, we've got a heartbeat handler, um, which reacts to experiments sending heartbeats to figure out which experiments are currently online. Um, and we've got this software called Snoop DAG, which uses a directed acyclic graph built from a lot of different plugins that can, for example, um, estimate the distance based on the number of neutrino events or triangulate the direction based on the arrival times of different at, at different detectors. Um, they can do, um, if, if we don't just send the initial arrival time, so the start time of the signal, but if, if detectors send the whole time series, they can do um, time series matching between different detectors um, to get a more accurate kind of time difference. Um, and they can then compare this direction estimate we get from that with the distribution of progenitor stars in the galaxy to figure out, especially for close supernova, um, individual progenitors that might be the source of the neutrinos. Right, so we've got a lot of these tools. Um, too much to talk about here. So I, if you're interested, I would encourage you to look at, um, at these on GitHub yourself. And then finally, um, we've got this on offline simulation uh, software. Um, and this is mainly in a tool called Snoopy, um, which does kind of three key things. First of all, it offers a unified interface to hundreds of supernova simulations. Um, because there are many groups around the world running computer simulations of supernovae um, to kind of figure out what neutrino signal we would see. Um, but those all use different codes. They use different output formats, um, different time binning, different energies uh, binning and so on. Um, so Snoopy gives you a simple unified interface to access all of these. Then between neutrinos being produced in the supernova and being detected on earth, a lot can happen, uh, right? Neutrinos are famous for, for oscillating. So if, even if you emit the electron neutrinos, they can turn into muon neutrinos um, before they arrive on Earth. 
So we have this large library of, of different flavor transformations um, that relate the produced neutrino fluxes to the detected ones. And then finally, we have a Python interface to snow globes, which um, kind of describes detector properties um, and which lets you go from the neutrino flux at your detector to actually event rates in many different neutrino detectors. And something I want to emphasize here is that the first two, uh, this unified interface to supernova simulations and the library of flavor transformations, those two are available to, to import from your own code. So for example, um, I'm uh, the developer of an event generator called SN Tools. Um, and I've um, last year started to include Snooze um, as dependency in SN Tools to get access to many more, um, to get access to many more supernova models and, and flavor transformations. Um, there's another software called Asteria, which was developed um, by IceCube, which does a similar thing. Um, and then um, in the last year or so, we've increasingly seen uh, some groups outside of Snooze uh, start to use Snoopy in, in their papers. Um, so for example, uh, simulations groups uh, that run a supernova model um, and want to easily see you know, what signal this would lead in various detectors. But um, I think instead of talking to talking about that, it's easier if I um, give you a little demo. Um, so let me um, switch to sharing the, um, the binder window. There we go. Um, so this um, is a, a demo notebook um, showing some of the features of Snoopy. Um, and we've got links here at the start with a GitHub repository, um, the Read the Docs page. And there's two publications on Snoopy. One is in the Journal of Open Source Software, um, which was a review of the Snoopy code itself. Um, and, and documentation, unit tests, stuff like that. And then there's this paper here um, in the Astrophysical Journal, uh, which focuses more on the underlying physics. Um, now to start with, what we'll do is um, we will download some sample data files. Um, Snoopy actually includes um, you know, data files from dozens of different model families hundreds of progenitors in, in total. Um, and here we will we'll use two of them, one by the Nakazato group and one by uh, Bolik et al, um, by the Garchin group. Um, come on. Got no kernel. There we go. Okay. Uh, the dangers of live demos. Um, so now you can see uh, I've actually let me um, use into presentation mode. Uh, you can see I've downloaded them into this new folder here called Snoopy Models, um, uh, which contain um, different different files. Um, for, for the different models. Um, in this case, you know, for, for the Bolic model, this is um, text file, this tabulated data of time, luminosity, mean energy and mean energy square. And you might think, wait a minute, from the mean energy and mean squared energy, I, can, I cannot extract the full spectrum, which is true. Um, so we have to assume some spectral shape. Um, to, to put these parameters in. Um, and all of that is included in Snoopy. Um, so Snoopy, Snoopy does all that for you. Um, and now in addition, there's, in addition to these model files, there's a readme here, um, which includes um, you know, the original source of these models. And there's also um, a notebook um, which demos uh, uh, 
uh, these models and gives you an overview of, of what you can do. Um, but back to the main notebook here. Okay, we've, we've downloaded these sample files. Um, and now let's start plotting them. And I'll, I'll take one model from, from Nakazato, one from Bollet. Um, you can see here's an overview of the, the Nakazato model. So that's a 20 solar mass model um, with a certain equation of state and a certain metallicity. Um, and now let's actually start plotting um, plotting the luminosity of this model. Um, and, and you can see the, here we've got um, this. So this is the first half a second after the explosion. Um, and, and you can see this is, um, sorry, after the um, core collapse. And you, you can see we've got this initial uh, neutronization peak here. A sudden peak in the electron neutrino signal. Um, and then if we look at later times, let's say if we look at um, let's say five seconds, if we plot this, you can see af after this initial activity, um, the luminosity pretty much just falls off exponentially. Um, so there's nothing very interesting happening happening here. Um, so, okay, so that's the um, neutrino flux um, as it is produced inside the supernova. Now let's go from this um, to the neutrino flux we'd actually detect on Earth. Now these can be quite different. Um, and just to, to show one example here, I will use the adiabatic MSW transformation. Um, and that's something that occurs because um, you've got this varying electron density in, in the star. Um, and as the neutrinos travel from the center of the supernova to its edge, um, electron neutrinos are affected by those um, by that electron density, whereas muon and tau neutrinos are not. And so that causes um, some flavor transformation. Um, first, I have these two helper functions to, to do some of the plots. Um, and then um, you know, while this plots, um, let's actually look at this helper function. So what we do here is um, we take a bunch of energies uh, between zero and 60 MeV. Um, we then get the initial spectra from the model um, at, a fixed, um, at a fixed time and at all of these energies. Um, so Snoopy does all the work behind the scenes to interpolate as needed by each different model um, and then gives me these initial spectra. And then there's a second function called get transformed spectra um, where I give it an additional flavor transformation um, and it will then apply that to the fluxes. Um, and then there's a bunch of plotting code um, Okay, now we've we've done that, and, and you can see here in, in the top line, um, you can see that from left to right, those are different time ranges. So maybe we'll just look at the uh, left panels. On the top, you have the untransformed um, flux, and you can see you've got this very high electron neutrino peak, the solid blue line. That's exactly what we saw earlier. But now if, if we apply these transformations in the second uh, or in, in the third row, um, you can see that this blue peak you know, decreases dramatically. Um, and instead the, the orange line, uh, which is muon or tau neutrinos, that increases. So we see some of these electron neutrinos being transformed into muon or tau neutrinos. Um, and you can see that the exact numbers vary in this case, depending on the mass ordering. So depending on which, which of the three neutrinos is the heaviest. Um, and then we can also plot the neutrino spectrum um, at a fixed point in time. Um, in this case, at, at 100 milliseconds. And you can see, um, in this case, solid lines are uh, untransformed. Uh, and, and dashed lines are transformed. 
Um, so you can see, for example, the um, in, in, in this case, the um, electron neutrinos on the left and the electron antineutrinos on the right decrease, um, but their energy spectrum actually changes um, because of this transformation. Um, so you can see, for example, that the dashed blue line here um, is much lower at, at these low energies, but actually is higher than the solid blue line, the untransformed spectrum at higher energies. Um, and we would see that um, in the detectable signal as well. Okay, so those are the neutrino fluxes um, at the detector. Um, but now can, can we actually calculate the event rates we would observe in the detector? And that's what this last part of the notebook does. Um, so what, what we do here, first of all, we pick um, a detector. In this case, we'll use a 100 kiloton water trank detector. So this is kind of similar to super Kamiokande or hyper Kamiokande. Um, we'll use, in this case, a bolic model. Um, and we'll start with no flavor transformation. Um, and then we'll just look at the first uh, one second of the neutrino signal. So now once we've set these parameters, we can do the calculation. We do this in three steps. First, we, we actually integrate the flux over this one second time interval to get the number of neutrinos. We then multiply that with the um, cross sections for individual interaction channels and with um, detector smearing um, and detector efficiency matrices. And these are all included in this uh, snow globe software I, I talked about at the start. Um, and then we finally collect all of these um, into a data table. And you can see that took just five or six seconds, um, which is orders of magnitude um, faster than if you were to run the whole proprietary detector simulation for each experiment. And now let's look at, at this table we got as a result. You can see we have a header, which gives us this, the, the, the energy um, ranges. And then um, we have multiple interaction channels. In this case, inverse beta decay, um, electron neutrinos and electron antineutrinos on oxygen 16. Um, we've got neutral current events and we've got electron scattering. And then of course we have this data array which has all the event rates. And so now we can go ahead and, and plot this. And you can see in, in just a few lines of code, um, we've actually got the total number of events. We've got the mean energy of these detected events. And we've got a plot um, of the observed event spectra in our detector split up by all the different channels, right? And so if, if you, for example, want to build a new detector, you were to write a white paper for this, this is a standard plot you would put in there. And, and you can see we got this in maybe 20 or 30 lines of code, just defining our models, um, sorry, defining our parameters, let's switch to a different detector, um, an, an argon detector, which is like, Kind of similar to Dune that's currently under construction in the US. We've got three lines to actually do the whole calculations. And then um, this. Uh, and, and then we can we have another you know 15, 20 lines or so to plot um, the event spectra for this different detector. Um, you can see this, this looks quite a bit, quite different. This neutral current scattering on, on argon. Just That's I want to just, weird. Uh, sorry to, to break your nice uh, mm -hmm. demo, just in case we are running out of the time and you already have three questions. So okay. take a look sure. on Slido and we probably sure. will need to, to wrap with you. Sure. So th this was the last time. Um, uh, yeah. I, I think we started a couple of minutes late, so, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm running a bit over. Um, so yeah, Snoopy gives a way to access hundreds of supernova models in a unified way, has these many different flavor transformations and an easy way to estimate event rates in neutrino detectors.
right? So that's useful, not just for us internally, but for pretty much anyone doing work with supernova neutrinos. Um, and questions, um, of course, feel free to contact me um, on Slack uh, or via email. And then let's look at um, the Q&A here. Um, let's see first question by Eduardo. Uh, SNOOS exists since over 20 years, but multimaster astronomy is relatively young. Uh, did SNOOS evolve for multimaster astronomy and how? Um, so yes, yes, we did. We are almost finished building this, this new, we call SNOOS 2.0. Um, and I had a little bit of that on the slides, um, but I, I also had to link to the um, to this news 2.0 white paper there, um, and I would encourage you to to look that up. Um, I'll put the slides um, actually in in the repo along with the uh, notebook um, as soon as I'm done with the talk. Another question uh, by Graham Stewart. Uh, does your community use Python mainly for convenience and familiarity? Do you need to take advantage of high performance Python, things like NumPy, Number, et cetera? Um, and I think it's, so a lot of it is, uh, yes, convenience, familiarity, also um, uh, easy to get started for, for new members joining. Um, and we are taking um, advantage of uh, NumPy heavily uh, and under the covers of, of Snoopy. Um, Number not currently. Um, but yeah, definitely, for example, the um, all these um, matrix multiplications to, to get uh, event rates and detectors, those are all in, in NumPy. Um, and a uh, question by Oksana, uh, how popular is the usage of JupyterHub notebooks for analysis in your community? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I can give a kind of representative answer there. Um, so in, in, in our case, we have, um, we use Jupyter notebooks heavily um, as, as documentation and as usage examples um, for, for Snoopy. I showed these uh, notebooks um, that were included in each um, model folder. Um, but we also have a bunch of other notebooks in the main Snoopy repository. Um, across the community, I think it, it's, it's mixed, varies a lot person to person. I see, um, thanks. And the last question I would propose then to move to Slack. Okay. Uh, so okay. we can even continue discussion there. So 